Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Resonant Arc Book Club. My name is Mike. My name's Kazen. Have a, a little bit of an announcement to make before we get started. And that is that, unfortunately, we're going to be canceling Book Club after we finish with the Silmarillion. Now, it's a very difficult decision. Before the five of you who watch this get really upset, understand that there are five of you. <laughs> <laughs> understand. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, so uh. mostly mostly the decision is coming from just the amount of time investment that goes into it, which is kind of a lot, uh, versus, you know, I, 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 I took way too long, basically, to get that Terranigma review out. Like, that should have been out last month, but it oh, just... Oh, and that... Yeah. Yeah, I need to be spending more time dedicated every day, which I've been doing for the last week or so. I've, I've, I've had a stream every single night where I'm actually working on the next video. And um, so anyways, yeah, I want to devote the time that's going into this, into creating more content for the channel and just into something that more people uh, are interested in. Now, that's not to say that we would kill this like forever. There's, there's an obviously if there's more demand for it later on, we can bring it back. But it actually was kind of spurned by the fact not only that it just it takes a lot of time. Yeah. Um, cause I want to still keep reading, but like having an assignment for the week, right. means like you've got to dedicate the right amount of time throughout the week to like get it done. Whereas if I could take right. it at my own pace, you know, then it wouldn't matter. And if I, I had something else that's more of a priority, I can dedicate my time to that. And yeah. So anyways, I was watching the very first book club video on the Witcher the very first episode that was uploaded and that was like edited and like it, it it moved better and it was like not so much rambling and I kind of decided like that was more what I wanted to do with this but then didn't really have time for it so mm. I still think I'm going to do like a whole Witcher series from books to video games like analysis of the whole thing and so I'm going to try to make like shorter, like more punctual, more like scripted sort of like book analysis, book reviews. That's still a possibility in the future. Sure, sure. Yeah. So it's not that we're not going to not cover literature or anything. It's just that this particular format, uh, I don't think there's enough interest in it for us to invest the kind of time that we are investing in it, if that makes sense. Um, you're saying internet culture doesn't love books? I might be saying that. <laughs> it looks like we lost Kaysen again. Uh, when Mike releases his book, you can resurrect Book Club. Maybe. Uh, if there's enough interest in that too, right? Like, uh, my, maybe my book sucks and nobody cares to talk about it. But uh, we shall see. We shall see what happens with that. Um, I'm going to wait just a minute for Kaysen to come back before we get started. But just needed to make that announcement real quick. Next week is going to be the last week for book club um so this week we're going to finish up with the silmarillion we'll have our last book club meeting next week and then we're going to be putting it on hiatus for a while looks like he he's gone Let's see if he can call me back here um i'm probably gonna have to edit this out now that i'm now that i'm thinking about it <laughs> Got the uh Okay, he's calling now. Whoa, what happened? Try that again. Hi. Hey, sorry about that. It's all good. I think I'm gonna have to do this again. Um ba -ba 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 -ba. where's the podcast? There it is. Move. I have to remove you out of all the other things whenever there's an issue. Really? I'll put you back in. I wish that um, they would fix this problem with uh, this particular error with with OBS. OBS. Yeah. yeah. Bam. There we go. We got you. You're back. 
Okay, guys. Uh, anyways, so just so you know, that's what's going on with that. So let's jump into um, let's jump let's jump into the analysis of the reading. So here is ultimately what I felt. Dang it! <laughs> Lost him like immediately as soon as I got him in there. We might try this one more time, and if it doesn't work, uh, he might not be able to join us today. Uh, let's see, we got, uh, Vesalius saying, might sound weird, but if Mike wore a Kuja costume, the viewing figures would be unreal. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Hello, Lil Trouble, how's it going? Sorry, we're having a little trouble as we speak with, uh, with Kaysen's internet here. Um, not sure why, but he's really struggling lately to stay connected. Ugh. Maybe he can just watch the stream and uh, comment. Let me actually tell him that real quick. Do 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 do. Um, if it's gonna. Give us trouble again. You could always just watch the stream and comment in the chat. Let's see what he says in response to that. He called again. Oh, whoops. No, he didn't. The only one here. The fetch. Did he say something? Uh, later. Why is it still calling? What the f? Is he calling me? So confused. <laughs> okay, we got you again. Try this one more time. Hi. Hi. Okay, if I if I go out again, and you usually don't have to call me back. Usually I just come back, but it's not letting me do that this time. That's weird. I'll chill out in the comments. Okay, sounds good. Um Here we go. We're recording. Everything's good. I've got this up. All right. So in this week's reading, um, like we kind of talked about it last week, like sort of foreshadowing the the fact that these stories that we'd be reading this week and, and next week, but most particularly this week are like, this is yeah. what we've been building up towards. Like this is, this is what all the context we've read previous to this was for. Like this is what, this is where it's at. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is, really where, this is the meat of the book. And um, what what I kind of noticed and, and where I was sort of inspired to uh, take screenshots and like come back and like revisit the parts like as I was reading them. Again, I've noticed on this reading more than any other time before just how prominent this sort of like underlying theme of of pride like the pride of the most powerful those with the most potential how th their pride just ruins everything if they would just not be so proud <laughs> and if they could just get, get like a little bit of humility like all of these characters like everything could be avoided and yeah. how that ties into fate the way that fate works <clears throat> in this in this story because mm. from the beginning, the fate of Arda was sort of decided in the music of the Ainur and the, the music of Iluvatar. But it's not it's not that fate like binds you or that you don't have free will. It's kind of just like 
those who make the dooms, those who predict what's going to happen, those who prophesy, they just know the temperament of the people and they and they they just predict the choices that they will make but it's not like mm-hmm. fate sort of like causes them or forces them into a certain uh choice or a certain like way of life or whatever it's just that these people's pride is so intense that they sort of have a self-fulfilling prophecy going on and despite mm-hmm. the fact that they are free they just they just knew what they were going to do ahead of time kind of a thing uh, Vesalia um, says a lack of humility is common a common trait in fantasy. Did J.R.R. set this trend? The answer is no. Um, that would probably be, be more along the lines of um, like ancient scripture and religious text and stuff. That sure. That's where a lot of this stuff really comes from. Yeah. Reading, uh, especially Christian scripture, you see yeah. that pride cycle Jewish. is all yeah. over it. All over it. Yep. Um. Uh, Greg says, if the book is a sandwich and this is the meat, is 80% of the book lettuce? <laughs> I skipped that comment on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> so no, 80% of the book is the setup to the killer stories. Payoff. Down. Well, and, and and that to me was really evident in reading this as well. Like, it was so apparent as I was reading this, like the the total necessity of the stuff that came before it. Like, I was thinking, what if I had just opened up to um this chapter of baron and luthien and started reading that um would i would it mean anything to me had i not known all of the stuff that came before it? i was kind of reading it with that question in mind and the answer is that like there's so freaking much stuff that if you didn't know what was going on in the world beforehand it would just be so weak like it would it wouldn't yeah. work you wouldn't know why it's important you wouldn't understand how these feats were so huge and and just like uh groundbreaking and so there is this is a very very context heavy story that we're reading and uh we mm. kind of talked a little bit about pace on the podcast on uh sunday which will be going up tomorrow on youtube and uh I don't know. It just it just became super evident to me as I was reading that the necessity for everything that we had read before, um, and it, it really comes together here. Like all that stuff that we've been reading before, like it all builds up to like Baron and Luthien and Turin Turambar and Fall of Gondolin and Ruin of Doriath and all that stuff. Yeah. Um. So instead of trying to summarize the entire thing because these are t- two of the longest chapters in the book by far are baron and Luthien and the, the chapter about turin they're they're between three and four times longer than any other chapter in the book which mm-hmm. also is ind- indicative to me that, like this is what we were really getting to right um greg is saying i would actually suggest people skipping to these parts if they've never read the book so that they that way they're hooked i was going to talk about that too And that's exactly what I was thinking. If you skipped to this moment right here and read it, would it mean the same? Would it, would it be a hook? I don't believe it would. If you do not, and and we'll go ahead, go ahead. Well, there's a, like the general idea of the story is kind of similar to some other ancient stories in that you've got a guy who likes a girl, but she's way too pretty for him. Her dad won't let him marry her. So her dad's like, Hey, go do this crazy thing. And so he goes and does the crazy thing. And then the guy still won't let him have her or whatever. Like they both die and then come back to life. It doesn't exactly have the same. Um, it, it like it, it is a typical story in that sense. I mean, there are stories in the Bible that are similar to that, but of course they don't go and cut off the Silmarils from the dark Lord's helmet, but still <clears throat> uh, like the, the fact that, you know, the father won't give the hand and expect some great feat to be done before the marriage it's it's pretty typical fantasy, and um, with the Silmarillion, it just it would it wouldn't be that great of a story without the 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 pretext, I guess. Uh, saying I think it would if you saw Lord of the Rings, you remember the Arwen Aragorn thing, and that's enough context for it to work. I don't it believe it is. Did I not don't work. believe the Arwen Aragorn thing did not work. 
I don't believe it's even close to enough context for it to work. No, that you was need... clearly, and it was evident from watching the films. This is clearly just thrown in there so that certain sections of the female audience that watch these movies would still kind of like it, I guess. I do think that you do, though, Greg. If you don't know what a Silmaril is, then why is the quest for the Silmaril even important to Thingol in the first place? Why is that such like an oh crap moment when like all the elves are like, you're really going to like send him out there to like try and get a Silmaril from the crown of Morgoth? Who's Morgoth? What's a Valar? Uh, what's a Silmaril? Why are the Silmarils important? Why are K Keligorm and Kurufin, uh like threatening Thingol if they don't? You know, you, there's just, I mean, I could go on a list of like 20, 30, 40 things that if you don't understand why those things are important it it kind of just makes it a very generic bland story like Kaysen is describing right without that context there's no power to it i don't think it would work literally at all without it so let's jump into a few of the the screenshots that i took um and we'll kind of go through them one at a time so let's see uh here this is where well i guess i can let's do, let's not do it this way actually <laughs> what? How do you wanna... let's just let's just try to summarize it quickly um because i took some screenshots from way into it so i, I didn't like talk about how the fact that like barra here and his like band mm -hmm. of uh like outlaws are still trying to like hold on to their lands and, and fight in those lands and just like fight the orcs and stuff so Barra here is Baron's father and he has like a group of guys that sort of like they have like a stronghold or like a cave that they hide in and it, it's secret they don't know where it's at Morgoth doesn't know where it's at so he commands Sauron like find those guys and like kill them um, and one of the guys in the group had a wife that was lost and uh they learn about this. Sauron learns about this, and so they they set up a, a, an entrapment, uh, a bewitchment at the house he used to live at. He would return there every now and then, you know, thinking about the good times. And so he thinks he sees his wife in there, and goes inside, and it's all set up, and it was a trap, and they take him, and they promise him, uh, or or he he says like, just promise me that you know, you allow me to see my wife again, because he thinks that she's alive and is being tormented. Or let me be with my wife again, something like that, if I sell out my buddies. And he's like, that's a small price to pay. It's easy. Because, you know, Sauron's thinking, yeah, I'll just kill you, send you to where your wife is, because she's dead, <laughs> in return for the information. So he gives it away. Baron was on a spying errand before then. The, the phantom of that guy goes and warns him, hey, um, uh, you know, the the hideouts being sacked like get back there quickly and he gets back his father's been killed everyone's been killed and so he sort of wanders for a while uh just doing what he can to sort of like get in the way be a thorn in the side of uh sauron and morgoth but eventually the the it just gets totally overrun and he has to flee to the south i remember the arid gorgoroth the mountains um and then the woods of doriath they're sort of like um I don't know, like a pass in between them of like river lands, flatlands, that sort of thing. Um, and so he wanders through there and he gets lost in Doriath. And then he, by chance or by fate, comes across uh, Luthien, mm. the elf princess, uh, the daughter of King Thingol and Melian. So the what's really interesting about this, they get into this actually a little bit later, is that... Luthien is actually mixed race Ainur and Eldar. <laughs> so, like, she's, like, mm. super, like, beautiful, powerful, like, all this kind of stuff. She has... And, and that's what I loved about this story, actually, is that, like, Baron, everything that he sort of attempts to do, he fails at. Mm. He gets captured. It doesn't work out. But Luthien is really, like, the one who saves him over and over again and like makes everything possible she's like the character mm. that is powerful and that accomplishes stuff in the story and when you think about 
all of the things that she's able to do, the powers that she had, I hadn't really connected that before, but yeah. she's she's part Maya. So, like, she's super powerful. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> she's half Maya. So it's, like, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, they meet. She brings him home. Of course, Thingol, as proud as he is, does not like that one bit. Is like, w w knowing the context behind the difference between the Edain and the, um, the Eldar, right? The difference of fate short-lived immortal i mean he just wanted no part of that it's like absolutely yeah. not not a chance that this is going to happen um and so what i was kind of showing there when i was showing my screenshot was uh that conversation and and we see the pride we just see the the pride of thingle again this reoccurring sort of like pride message right uh, so he's like, see now, I too desire a treasure that is withheld for rock and steel and the fires of Morgoth keep the jewel that I would possess against all the powers of the elf kingdoms. Yet I hear you say that bonds such as these do not daunt you. Go your way, therefore, bring me in your hand a Silmaril from Morgoth's crown. And then, if she will, Luthien may be set, may set her hand in yours. Then you shall have my jewel, and though the fate of Arda lie within the Silmarils, yet you shall hold me generous. So, part of this is like, a, he's just going to send him on an impossible mission to just say, like, no. Like, you're not going <laughs> to wed my daughter. And part of it is that. But part of it, I think we start to see the disposition, the hidden disposition of Thingol. Like, the fact that he wants to, he really does desire to hold the Silmaril against the Sons of Fanor is mm -hmm. going to play like, plays like a really large role into the downfall of Doriath itself. Like, he hated them from the start, obviously had good reason to with the Kinslaying. Like, they yeah, killed exactly. his brother and, and, and his people. But now it's like, you know, again, the pride that comes from... Um, the need to sort of like show them, put them in their place, the sons of Fanor, and, and show like who's really king in Middle Earth, you know, and, and to get back at them, have revenge on them for that, mm -hmm. is this, the beginning of the unravelings here in Doria. And um, anyways, what I found interesting is that the, the kind of the three stories, uh, I would say, starting with Maeglin, like Maeglin going into Gondolin, yeah. then Baron and Luthien here, and then the story of Turin, basically lead to the downfall of the three hidden strongholds in uh, Beleriand, with Nargothrond's fall. Uh, Turin is mostly to do with that. Um, with Doriath's fall, what happens here with Baron and Luthien, Baron and Luthien is mostly to do with that. And then Maeglin with the fall of Gondolin. Um so anyways, the way that fate is sort of weaved into this is something that I found really profound. Like it's it's not um like there's a depth to the way he uses fate in the story in my opinion. Like it's not just oh here's fate and so this is how it's going to happen. Like it really gets into the details of like what went wrong and why and like this was the start of this that led to this event and this event and like the lineages working into that and the different characters and and their interactions with each other and all of it going back to the, the kin slaying it's just like every event there's so many things there's so many working pieces in the fate and and then how the fate comes about that it makes the whole like premise of the song of iluvatar really nuanced because it's like not any one of the vala like could really understand the music in a whole or could like really see it beginning to end except mandos and that was like his entire job <laughs> so you know they the, the whole premise of like no one really totally understanding the mind of iluvatar or trying to like like melkor did trying to like take over and like bend it to his own will like, mm -hmm. all of that came together. Every piece 
Every single person in this world was accounted for in that music, and each person's playing their part uh, through the choices that they make and just weave this really interconnected fate that and and when you watch it unfold it's like oh if just this had changed or just that had changed or if they had just done this differently or they could have just humbled themselves for one second right here the whole thing would have been different but it always is like those i guess like the sum of all of these tiny parts coming together into the fate of arda into the the music of the Ainur, and uh, like it was all foreshadowed right at the very beginning it just really struck me as being like very very well written and planned and thought out in such a way to where it feels believable and yeah. real and like it, it really is out of any one person's control like no one person can like alter the entire fate but when they're all coming together and they're all making their individual choices and they're all kind of messing up it just sort of like leads into this this fate that was you know foreshadowed from the beginning hmm. i don't know it was i think awesome. that's really cool and it's beautiful especially the way like Luvatar starts the song and everyone's singing and then morgoth comes in and he kind of like messes the song up and it's like all of a sudden and this happens multiple times like each new age almost right mm -hmm. and then they come down to earth and what happens they're all trying to do the thing right and then morgoth comes and messes it up just like the music had sort of predicted yeah. because of his temperament that's just kind of what happened and then you know things happen morgoth gets put in his place and eventually he's able to come out and participate again and then he screws everything up again and then they kind of start over and they sink half of you know the land and everything gets all screwed up and then things go back to how they were. And it's just kind of funny that that's, that's really how the songs went. And that's how this is all gone too. Yeah. And so this passage here, which reads, Thus he wrought the doom of Doriath and was ensnared within the curse of Mandos. And those that heard these words perceived that Thingol would save his oath and yet send Baron to his death. For they knew that not all the power of the Noldor before the siege was broken had availed even to see from afar the shining Silmarils of Fanor. So this, mm -hmm. this thing that Thingol did, telling him, go get me a Silmaril, literally led to the doom of Doriath. Like, this one choice that doesn't seem like it could possibly be connected, mm -hmm. like, led to Thingol's undoing. And it's all due to his pride. Like, not a chance that a mortal man should even, like, you know, be in the presence of my daughter, who is part Maya. And, and of the blood of the Eldar. Like, that pride, which led him to make this request of him, is what led to the downfall of Doriath. And we'll get into that in a little bit here in a minute. But anyways, the way that it's all mingled, I just found it to be really deep and nuanced. And the way it all comes together, just really profoundly written. I think so. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Let me skip ahead a little bit here. So anyways, the first thing that Baron decides to do is he decides to go and visit uh, Finrod. Actually, that was one thing I wanted to correct from last week. I forgot that. I needed to make a correction. I, I kind of mixed up Finrod with Fingon in some of the things that I was accounting oh. for last week. So Fingon is the High King of the Noldor at this point since Fingolfin was killed by Morgoth. Yeah. So Fingon is the oldest son of Fingolfin, and he is the High King of the Noldor right now, he was the one that rescued Maedhros from uh, the Tower of Thangorodrim. Um, it was not Finrod, right? And uh, Turgon, I think Kaysen's going to be piecing out for the time being. He's going to be in the... Oh, he's back. He's back. He's good. Uh, yeah. So Fingon is the son of Fingolfin. Turgon is Fingon's brother. Uh, Finrod mm. is the son of Finarfin. His brother is Angrod and a couple of others, but Orodreth is his nephew. He's eventually going to be um, the king in um, Nargothrond. But anyways, uh, I had said, I had equ I had equated or, or given some of the, um, the some of the things that Fingon had done, but I, I credited them to Finrod last week, so I wanted to make mm. sure to clear yeah. that up. Anyways, uh, the first thing Baron does is go to Finrod in Nargothrond, who had made sort of like an oath to his family lineage back with Beor, 
uh, they had a ring in the family line. This actually is the same ring that Aragorn wears in the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Um, which is, a, 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 it was um, an elven ring given to that house of men and sort of signified their lineage. So he goes there with the ring and um, basically requests Finrod's help in recovering this Silmaril. And, and Finrod's like, well, this is not, this is a rock and a hard place for me because I'm bound to help you and I, I would like to do that. But I have two of the sons of Feanor here and they have a pretty strong hold of the people. And if, if mm -hmm. I announce what I'm doing, that I'm going to go get a Silmaril so that you can take that to King Thingol. That's not going to go well with the Sons of Feanor here. <laughs> yep. Um, but he's like, you know, I made an oath. I have to keep it. So he announces he's going to be leaving. He leaves it in the, the, the kingdom, the Nargothron itself, in the hands of his nephew Orodreth. But he's, the Sons of Feanor have a, a lot of sway. The people, they're, they're the, the, he does mention that the the sons of Fanor and the Noldor as a whole had like they were the best with like speechcraft, so they were really good, mm. powerful speakers. And um, anyways, Kor Kelagorm and Kurufin, um hold a lot of sway. People are kind of like following them more than they're actually following Finrod or or Orodreth at this point. And anyways. This will come into account a little bit later, but they start to get it in their hearts that they're going to usurp Nargothrond and that they're going to become the lords of that stronghold and they're going to take it away from the house of Finrod um, and from Orodreth and that's going to become their stronghold. Now remember, they were kind of beaten back from that... From that uh, Morgoth unleashed his armies and Kelegorm and Kurufin had to flee from their lands and so that's why they came here. <clears throat> to Nargothron, but now they're they're thinking they're going to take it over, basically. Mm. Anyways, in leaving the situation as is there, we go with Baron and Finrod, and they're going to basically try to get to um, to Morgoth's stronghold and take a Silmaril. So they're going in disguise. Um, it, it talks about this um, this wizardry back and forth between Sauron and and King Finrod. And uh, they, they have a whole song written about it. Um, really well written. I liked the poetry of the song. But eventually Sauron has the mastery, uh, uncovers them, um, and is basically having his werewolves go in and pick them off one at a time, like the whole company, one at a time, just devouring them to try and get them to like reveal who they are. Because he doesn't know uh, who they are or what their mission was, basically. Mm -hmm. So that's the situation they're left in. Luthien learns about this. Thingol traps her in a, like a house in this tall tree and doesn't want her to leave, but she escapes. And uh, she she goes to Nargothron to sort of like learn about, you know, what happened, like where they went, um, try and get some people on her side to go and help save them. Uh, Caligorm, I think it is, decides, uh, I really like her. I'm going to force her. I'm going to force her father to give me her hand in marriage. They're going to like trap her there in Nargothrond. The, the sons of Feanor, for the most part, aside from Maedros, are not good dudes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but Kelagorm had a hound. One of the coolest characters in the entire book for me. Yeah. Named Hu Huan. Huan. Han, Han. Yep, Huan. How do you spell it? Or how do you pronounce it? <laughs> H. Uh, oh, I think it's Huan. That's the, the I think at least it's Huan. the reading. The reading of the, um, we call it the audiobook. Uh, ah, okay. That way. Uh, so Caligorm had a hound named Huan. He was not born in Middle Earth, but came from the Blessed Realm, for Orome had given him to Caligorm long ago in Valinor, and there he had followed the horn of his master before evil came. Huan followed Caligorm into exile and was faithful, and thus he too came under the doom of woe set upon the Noldor, and it was decreed that he should meet death not until he encountered the mightiest wolf that would ever walk the world. So, uh, Juan's freaking awesome. First of all, <clears throat> I wanted to bring up really quick, uh, you know, the topic about pacing and <clears throat> which information is necessary to have and which you can give in the moment. Because, you know, we've, we've been talking about, uh, well, we need all this context before we get up to this point, right? But Juan 
was not mentioned before we got here. When when it became time to talk about Juan, when Juan became pertinent to the story, that's when he was introduced, right? So mm. I could see people saying, well, why can't you do that for this other information? The Silmarils, for Morgoth himself, for the Vala and the Maya. Like, why couldn't you just talk about them in these stories when they're pertinent? My answer to that is that there are some details like this to which there just isn't enough context to where it was necessary to like have a whole page dedicated to that chapters beforehand so that we would know who Juan is before we came here, right? Some right. things you can do this with. That being said, um, this chapter is, I think, the longest chapter in the entire book, I, I believe. And, and, you know, I think Turin, Turin Bar is like just a little bit shorter, but they're about the same length. Um, if you wanted to do that for this particular story, <laughs> this, this chapter would be just three times, four times longer than it is, right? So you, yeah. can't, you can't do that too much. There are still a lot of things that need the proper setup before we get here um, so that you don't have to just like, by the way... Uh, this is important to know right now. Okay, let's get back to the story because that's essentially what they did. He did a, a little paragraph break here to say like, now it's important that you know he had a wolf, he had a hound named Juan. He came from the Blessed Realm. He was a hound of Orme. You know, the fact that we know who Orme is is important. That gives some context to the fact that Orme was like a hunter, like the best hunter of yeah. any being on the planet. And Juan was his hound at one time. So anyways... Juan's super cool, though. So he's his doom is that he will not die until he encounters the mightiest wolf that would ever walk the world. And this is important for the whole um, the whole pride thing I've been talking about. Mm. Um, because... Well, that, that's, I, okay, so she didn't... Luthien didn't just go into Nargothrond on her own. She was discovered by Kelegorm and Kurufin and Juan as they were out hunting. Right, so Juan found her, brought her to his master, then they took her back to Nargothrond and kind of trapped her there. And Juan mm. felt guilty, so he helped her escape. And mm. they went together to go and rescue Baron. Um, and so, anyways, they get there, and uh, Juan's a freaking beast, but he, he kills uh, Dragluin, who is like the the beastliest werewolf in Sauron's uh, ranks. And so Sauron, knowing the fate of Juan, says to himself, hmm, I think I'll become the mightiest wolf that has ever walked the face of the earth, and I'll be the one to kill Juan, right? So mm. Morga or Sauron's pride is strong enough to assume he's beastly enough to be the one who's going to fulfill that sort of like destiny of Juan. And right. so he goes to fight him in the form of the mightiest werewolf that has ever walked the face of the earth. And it does not go well for him. <laughs> no, Juan, jacked. Juan is so beastly that he jacks up, um, he jacks up Sauron. Uh, let me actually read this really quick. Uh, uh, so Draglin came to Sauron and says, Juan is there. Now Sauron knew well, as did all in that land, the fate that was decreed for the hounds of Valinor, or the Hound of Valinor. And it came into his thought that he himself would accomplish it. Therefore he took upon himself the form of a werewolf and made himself the mightiest that had yet walked the world. And he came forth to win the passage of the bridge. Um, so yeah, anyways, they fight and Juan has got a hold of him. And Sauron keeps trying to change form into a, into a serpent, into a bat, into like all these things, back into his normal form. He's just trying to get away, trying to escape. And Juan doesn't let him go. <clears throat> um, he goes in shame. And uh, I think that Luthien says something to him that I really liked. Again, this is um, the language of the book that I really love. I really love. So Luthien came to him and said that he should be stripped of his raiment of flesh and his ghost be sent quaking back to Morgoth. And she said, There everlastingly thy naked self shall endure the torment of his scorn, pierced by his eyes, unless thou yield to me the mastery of thy tower. Like, <clears throat> the language wow. is so beastly, dude. <laughs> powerful, yeah. <laughs> uh, Super powerful. This is one of the reasons why, again, I've talked about this in previous bookcasts, but, or, or pot, pot, uh, 
book club streams. But there is such a power just in the language ex itself, right? Like English used to carry, I think, yeah. more weight <laughs> back yep. in, in Shakespeare's time and in King James' time than it carries now. Um, larger vocabulary, more words, more expressive. And the fact that this book is written in that language, to me, gives it that weight of being ancient and epic and huge and, and that... I mean, the whole book sort of like hinges on that point, right? Because this is supposed to be, this is supposed to make Lord of the Rings feel like a footnote, which it becomes here yeah. towards the end of the Silmarillion. And yeah. the language, I think, really helps with that, the way that they talk. So there's just so many lines like that that I love. Um, anyways, they, they rescue Baron and they bring him back. Finrod had been killed. Um, so, you know, the elves mourn him. They learn about the treachery that the elves in Nargothrond learn about the treachery of <clears throat> um, Kelogram and Kurofin. They kick him out. And so as they're leaving, going back to their brother Maethros, <clears throat> they come across Baron and Luthien. Um, they try to mm. kidnap her again. Baron fights them. Juan at that point is like, nope, I'm turning for real against my master and uh, I'm not going to serve him anymore. So he helps him out. <clears throat> Anyways... As they're leaving, because they're freaking stupid, they shoot some darts back. Uh, I think one of them hits uh, Baron. Anyways, the Sons of Fan are, are terrible. I hate those guys. Yeah. Um, but anyways, they kind of are at an impasse, because it's like, look, we can either wander around in exile for the rest of our lives, Baron and Luthien are talking about this, or you can try and fulfill the quest. And either way, I'm coming with you, kind of a deal, right? So mm. keep in mind, she had just saved him. She, she and Juan were powerful enough to, to get into, essentially, the, the dungeons of Sauron's fortress and rescue them and, like, send Sauron running away. Mm -hmm. And Baron's like, nah, I'm going to make sure you're safe and then I'm going to go alone <laughs> right. to try and go get this silver ale. Yeah. Um, There's an element of pride there, too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, right? And it doesn't work out for him, again. No, no, um, not at all. So, he gets lucky. So anyways, she comes after him with Juan. Uh, she takes on a disguise, a form of like a vampiric bat-like creature. Juan is one of the wolves. And uh, they give a wolf haim, as they call it, to Baron as well. And so they're sort of like traveling together. And he's sort of like, fine, like, come with me. You know, whatever happens. We're doing this together. They get all the mm. way, all the way to the fortress of Morgoth himself. They enter in. They go down, and again, it's Luthien who, let's see if I can read this because I thought it was pretty powerful as well. Um, it's gone the fair. Oh, I, I should also say that there is a wolf that Morgoth has been raising called Karkaroth. And this is the mm. real mightiest wolf that's ever lived, right? right? And Karkaroth is guarding the gate that they show up to. And as and they know that the wolf form that I think Baron had taken, is, that wolf was dead. So like they were aware like something is wrong here, something's not right. Like that, you're not supposed to be alive. And when that happens, uh, Luthien is just like, Yep, go to sleep now. She like casts a spell on Karkaroth and it says that he was um, struck like lightning. Essentially just like, just like fell over into a deep sleep and they just walked straight in. And she's so powerful. <laughs> I know, dude. She's a freaking <laughs> really powerful. Yeah. So they just walk straight up to Morgoth basically. And again, pride plays a huge, uh, huge toll here with him again. Uh... Where did it go? Did I not capture it? Man, I wish I had because it was really in, it was really powerful the way it was written. Basically, he lusted for her. And and it says something along the lines of like one of the most evil designs of Morgoth was like coming about in his mind. He was going to essentially like try and rape her, I think is the is the implication there, right? Mm -hmm. But she's she's dancing there. She took some she casts off the the vampiric form as innocent in her true form 
but she casts a spell on him as well, and the iron crown comes rolling onto the floor, and Baron was put to sleep as well by the spell. She wakes him up. He cuts the Silmaril, and uh, basically they have what they came for, and he decides, no, I'm going to try and get all three Silmarils. Yeah. And as he's trying to do that, fate won't have it, cuts his blade on the crown. Karakaroth wakes up. Uh, they have to try and flee. Um, they're eventually saved by the eagles. Eagles always coming in to save people at the yep. right minute, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, some people are like, oh, the eagles are a deus ex machina. I'm not going to argue that they aren't, because they pretty much serve that purpose all the time in these stories. Well, so deus ex machina, in, in general, is the assumption that they're... Like, you operate on the assumption that they're... I don't know how you put it. You have to operate on the assumption that there isn't a god in, in, a, in a book that doesn't mm -hmm. explicitly say that there is a god. And... Then all of a sudden, well, God, Deus Ex Machina means God out of the machine, meaning meaning that oh, God uh, like is manifest through this book in some weird, you yeah. know, uh, miracle, right? However, in the Silmarillion, Deus Ex Machina <laughs> makes it's it's not it's not the same thing because there are gods in this book, and they right. literally do have like some vested interest in what happens in these people over here. And there are plenty of gods, and they sent these eagles there for a reason. So it is Deus Ex Machina, but not in the same way that like a normal narrative or a, a book that has no reference to deity whatsoever does that same kind of thing. Sure. And I was actually going to point out that the fact that they are eagles essentially ties them to Manwe. So anytime the eagles show up, this is Manwe's way of having an influence over you know, what happens in Middle-earth. It's his... Because, you know, you have Olmo there who's, like, speaking to the people through the waters. I think when uh, Hurin and Hur were trapped in that battle, he he created a mist from the river that they were fighting by, you know, and sort of, like, helped them escape. So the Valar are having an effect. Um, they're, they're working to try and help them, even though they, they had the Doom of Mandos and they said, you're basically... You're basically exiled from Valinor now, right? Like, you, you will no longer have the aid of the Valar. You no longer have the favor of the Valar. Yet still, right. Manwe, through the eagles, keeping watch on what's happening over there, is having his hand, his influence in trying to help, uh, you know, forego more, or, or um, you know, stop Morgoth and help the children of Iluvatar. So... Anytime the eagles come in and save someone, you can kind of see it as like Manway's hand in like trying to sure. do what he can. Yeah. Um. Anyways, when they are leaving, though, uh, Kar Karkaroth is awakened, and um, Baron has the Silmaril in his hand, and he and it's I mean this is the the light of the trees, right? So he holds that out in front of Karkaroth's face, and is like, you can't like. You know, like, get out of the way, basically. This is a light that uh, you can't um, <clears throat> withstand. Something along those lines. Thinking that it would be, like, something that would make Karkaroth shrink away. But Karkaroth's like, nope, I'm biting your hand off and taking that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Karkaroth swallows the Silmaril, and it is, you know, I don't think we've touched on this. Maybe we didn't touch on it at all. But the basically, the curse that's laid on the Silmarils is anyone other than the House of Fanor essentially any evil anyone with evil intent that touches the Silmaril would be consumed with fire basically so this entire time Morgoth has a, a, a pain of burning in his hand that he suffers with constantly like so he feels like the pain of being on fire in the hand that took the Silmarils like for eternity mm -hmm. So you got to imagine that that's also a factor in the fact that you know when he was fighting Fingolfin he's weakened like, Morgoth is not at his full power anymore. He's constantly, like, feeling the pain of being burned. <laughs> He's got this heavy burden on the crown with the Silmarils. He's, like, issued out all of his power into his armies and stuff like that. And so he's not the Vala that he once was. Mm -hmm. So when Karkaroth takes the Silmaril, it just starts burning his insides. And he just goes freaking crazy. And uh, he's just running completely mad, like, around, and, and he's very, very frightening 
a uh, berserk kind of like stage for this wolf. So anyways, they try to go, they go back, uh, the, the eagles take them back, they go into Doriath, they explain what happened, and Thingol asks him, like, show me the Silmaril or whatever, and he's like, and he holds up his, his, his arm with the, the chopped off, bitten off hand, and he's like, you see, in my hand, I, I brought you the Silmaril, but it's in the stomach of, of uh, Karkaroth now. So mm -hmm. Thingol at this point is finally moved and is like, okay, like, there's something different about Baron and the House of Baor, and there's more nobility here than I gave it credit for. And so they assemble a team to go and hunt Karkaroth, and in so doing, Baron is slain, and uh, his spirit leaves. But um, Luthien asked him, please, like, wait for me in the halls of Mandos. And, and, you know, humans aren't supposed to go to the halls of Mandos. Their man's fate is different than the fate of, of the Eldar, right? Hmm. Um, but uh, it says here, thus ended the quest of the Silmaril, but the lay of Lathian, released from bondage, does not end. For the spirit of Baron, at her bidding, tarried in the halls of Mandos, unwilling to leave the world until Luthien came to say her last farewell upon the dim shores of the outer sea, whence men that die set out never to return, basically. Um, so his spirit remained unwilling to leave and Luthien, uh, basically soon died of just grief herself. They, she went to the halls of Mandos and she, she wrote a song about their love and their life and the things that they had done on their quest. And it was so moving that the Valar, all the Valar and Mandos most of all was so moved by it that he was like, okay, I will allow you to see baron and then they give her a choice essentially like are you going to stay here with us in valinor and you can be healed of all of your hurts and forget all the things you suffered in life or you can receive the same fate as that of men because he took it to Iluva to manway and manway tried to take it to iluvatar and ask like what should be done here i can't mess with the fate of man i can't keep him here mm -hmm. obviously so what do we do <laughs> And so he came back after communing with Iluvatar and gave her the choice to become mortal and accept the fate of men or to stay in Valinor with the Valar and have all of her woes healed over time. Of course, she chooses the fate of men and that she will die indeed and go with Baron, but they're given a, a, a resurrection essentially. So they, they come back in Middle-earth again and they live out their lives, but when they die, they die for real. And... Mm -hmm. It says, it, it kind of goes over, um, it goes over what, like Melian, what Melian felt about this and like just the grief that she had because she with the other Ainur, the other Maya and Valar, as well as, you know, Thingol, that's a true loss for them. Like otherwise the elves know, well, when we die, we go to the Halls of Mandos and we'll be reunited at some point. Like, eventually we can see our friends again yeah. in the afterlife, right? But not not now. <laughs> when she chose that fate, Melian and Thingol, for all they know, they lost their daughter forever. And it was, like, a super big deal. And, like, you just kind of see the, the sorrow, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the weight of the Eldar who lose their friends among men or who lose their... And, and this gives a lot of context to even like Elrond and Arwen in yeah. The Lord of the Rings, right? It's not just about the fact that I'm going to go to Valinor and I won't see you anymore. No, that wouldn't be it for Elrond. Like, I'm going to go to Valinor and I'll never see you again, ever. Because when you die, your soul goes away and I have to stay here until like the the complete end of the world kind of a thing. Mm. So it's a big deal. Uh, but this is kind of the end of the story. It's uh, so it was that alone of the Eldalia, she has died indeed and left the world long ago. Yet in her choice, the two kindreds have been joined and she is the forerunner of many in whom the Eldar see yet, though all the world is changed. The likeness of Luthien, the beloved, whom they have lost. Wow. So, great story. 
Love that one. Uh, here, oh, here it is. Here it is. This is what we're talking about Melanie. It was in the next chapter. That's why. Uh, the parting beyond the end of the world had come between them, and no grief of loss has been heavier than the grief of Meli and the Maya in that hour. Uh. Then Baron and Luthien went forth alone, fearing neither thirst nor hunger, and they possessed beyond, or they passed beyond the great river Gellion into Assyrian and dwelt there in Tul Galen, the Green Isle, in the midst of the Adirant until all tidings of them ceased. So they lived out the rest of their very short lives in Assyrian. And it was sad, bittersweet kind of story, right? Um, but really good. But the, the really bad part about all this... Is that Thingol kept the Silmaril. <laughs> the really, mm. really bad part that comes from all this is that Thingol's like, yep, this is mine now. And so now we know that the, the, the oaths of the sons of Fionor say, like... They're going to kill anyone who tries to keep a Silmaril from them. So now we have Doriath, where Thingol is keeping their Silmaril. And the Sons of Fanor, not going to be down with that. So we have yep. a sundering He could of... be like, dude, there's two other Silmarils up. Like, go find Morgoth and get the other two. <laughs> Don't fight me. <laughs> well, this story actually played a huge role in Maethros deciding, do you know what? I think we could actually fight Morgoth. Luthien and Baron went in yeah. by themselves yeah. and stole a Silmaril from his crown. He's not unassailable. He's not yep. unstoppable. We should freaking fight a war and end this. But the problem is, Thingol is keeping a Silmaril from the Sons of Feanor. So an alliance of all of the current elven lords and kingdoms is not possible. And yeah. because of Thingol's pride... He doesn't join them. He uh, There's a couple of elves from Doriath who are like, I can't not participate in this battle. I have to go. And he's like, fine, you can go. But he doesn't send an army. He doesn't send any real help in their fight in this war against Morgoth at all. And like when you read about this next battle, which is of all the on-screen battles, so to speak, that Tolkien has written, this is the most freaking epic one that there is. <laughs> this, this one is awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Maethros tries to unite everybody and Fingon and all of his people are going to go. Finrod sends an army from, or not Finrod, uh, Orodreth, because Finrod's dead now. Hmm. Orodreth sends an army from Nargothrond. Even Turgon sends a, a pretty sizable army from Gondolin as well. Um, they get a lot of strength. And, and of course the, the, diff the, the three houses of men, you know, they join in. This is a huge battle that takes place. Yeah, even um, some dwarves were involved. Oh, and dwarves were involved too, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Actually, matter. one of my favorite parts, I, I screenshotted it, was a description of what the dwarves do in this battle. But, um, so, there's a couple of key problems that happen. One of them is that they're not totally united. Um, yeah. Two is that uh, Maedhros' armies in the east arrived late because they had spies deep in their councils that uh, warned them of a false attack coming in a certain region. And so they, they went to like strengthen that place first and didn't arrive on the battlefield at the appointed time. And mm. so Fingon and his people are there in the West. Um, Gondolin's forces show up totally unforeseen. No one thought that they would come, but they came yep. um, and they joined with Fingon, his or with Fing on his brother, Turgon and Fing on her brothers. Um, Huan, or Huar and hu, uh, Hurin are there. Remember, they were the two uh, boys who had been to Gondolin and then had left. This yeah. is very important context, especially especially with Hurin for the next part of the book. Yep. Um, but they're waiting. They're waiting. The, the orcs are out there in the battlefield. The elves and the men, all their armies, the dwarves are out there in the battlefield. But they're waiting for Maethros to show up. And uh, there was a, an elf named Gwyndor who came out of Nargothrond. Uh, this is important because he's going to be he's going to be a major character in the story of Turin. Gwyndor, his brother had been lost in a previous battle, so he was going there to avenge his brother's life. But it turns out his brother was not killed; he was alive, and the orcs brought him out and said, yeah. "We have many more back at home." 
and we will treat with them the same way. They cut off his arms and legs and his head last really cruel death that they inflicted on him. And Gwyndor was like, okay, that's enough. And the elves begin the battle. They rush in and start fighting. And it almost it almost backfired <laughs> on Morgoth. They really, like, jacked up his armies, and they got all the way to the doors of, of Angband, but mm. um, were eventually trapped there, and Gwyndor was taken prisoner, and fin- Fingon was beaten back. And so the fighting's not going well. Um, <clears throat> things are not working out. But then finally, several days later, Maethros arrives, it seems like just in time, and even then, they would have won had it not been for the, essentially, the Easterlings, who become the Easterlings in the, men, the yeah. Lord of the Rings time. They betray from the rear, and they come in and start attacking. They cause a bunch of chaos, and the League is broken, and uh, the Morgoth ends up winning this battle. Um, but it was close. I mean, both sides, tremendous losses. And again, if Thingol had joined in the battle... They would have won. If if yep. it not for the treachery of the Easterlings, they would have won. If not for Gwyndor, like, yes. getting pissed off and starting right, the going attack too, too early, early yeah. they would have won. So, anyways, it was close, but essentially fate wins out again uh, due to pride, treachery, all that kind of stuff. And, of course, that's all Morgoth's realm. I mean, that's where his power really lies, is in his ability to spread lies dissension among his enemies and uh, he was able to beat them solely on that not by just the power of his uh, his armies themselves but he empties Angband and so we've got this battle has dragons and balrogs and just like massive creatures and monsters fighting and like the strongest of the elven lords and the the dwarves have these masks that they've created, right? And it's the they're the only ones who can withstand the blast of Gla- Glaurung the dragon. Uh, they create these masks that can withstand his fire, and they can fight him back, and they wound Glaurung. But like the the lord of the dwarves is killed in battle, and um, there's a, there's a passage here that I love. It, it just like so perfectly like sums up the temperament of dwarves, really. And when his rage, uh, when in his rage, Glaurung turned and struck down Asgal, the lord of Balagast, the, the lord of the, the dwarves of Balagast, and crawled over him with his last stroke, Asgal drove a knife into his belly and so wounded him that he fled the field, and the beasts of Angband in dismay followed after him. Then the dwarves raised up the body of Asgal and bore it away, and with slow steps they walked behind, singing a dirge in deep voices, as it were a funeral pomp in their country, and gave no heed more to their foes, and none dared to stay them. Wow. Just, Dude, that's so powerful, man. Super <laughs> sick. <laughs> that's so powerful. Super sick. Uh, love the language. The battle is really epic. Um, you get to see kind of all three races, men, elves, and dwarves, achieve a lot of valor in this battle, but when it all comes down to it, uh, they uh, Tur, Tur, uh, Turgon barely escapes back into Gondolin, obviously shuts it out so that no one can find it. Gothmog, the lord of the Balrogs, captures Hurin alive. Um, Huor actually makes, uh, where is it? Well, makes a prophecy. Uh. Yeah, he gets shot, but he makes a prophecy before that happens because they're trying to convince hmm. Turgon to go back to Gondolin. And Turgon's like, no, I can't like leave the field, not now. And he's like, and and uh, he makes um. Huar makes uh, a prophecy here. He says, then Huar spoke, and said, yet it stands but a little while. Then out of your house shall come the hope of elves and men. This I say to you, Lord, with the eyes of death. Though we part here forever, and I shall not look on your white walls again. From you and from me, a new star shall rise. Farewell. So this is a foreshadowing of Erendil. Uh, yeah. which is going to come from the lineage of Turgon and Huar, another merging of men and elves in marriage that will lead to an elf that is going to essentially save uh, all these people in the end. Because after this battle, it's like, it's basically the three kingdoms. The three hidden kingdoms are, is all the refuge that's left and cured in the shipwright. But even he, he gets attacked 
And so like most of the land is overrun and overtaken by Morgoth's servants. And so the only three strongholds left, the only three refuges uh, left for, for these people are Nargothrond, Doriath, and Gondolin. And beyond that, everything else has been overrun. Yeah. And so Hurin is taken captive to Angband. And remember, he knows where Turgon's people are located. He knows where the city of Gondolin is located. And Morgoth, above all else, wants to know that. That is the one thing he wants to know the most. Because he actually had a foreshadowing about Turgon back in Amman, back in the Blessed Realm. He had tried, you know, like figuring out like, okay, who can I work with here? Who's going to listen to me and not? And Turgon, he had always had a forewarning about like, this guy's going to, he's going to be my undoing somehow. I just have a feeling about this guy. Hmm. And so the fact that he has a city that's hidden, he has no idea where it is, really bugs him and it mars his victory. And so he wants to know that. So he brings her in up to the top of the tower and puts him in a chair and chains him to it. And, um, and basically is trying to torment him into, uh, into telling him where it is. Now I'm trying to find... Real quick, Greg Troyan says, the Hurin Turin arc is the one arc in the book where I completely agree with you about context being essential. Yeah. Because it spans so far back and it goes through the with Gondolin. It's also interconnected with the story of, of Turin and of yeah. Turin. This one would be... Because you can actually get this... Actually, Baron of Luthien is its own book now, too. It is um, now, as of last year, I think. That's, I think, the yeah. last one I haven't read yet. So I think I'm actually well, going to pick it up It's the last one that, this. that's, that's going to be written. Because Christopher Tolkien, after that book was published, he stepped down as the head of the Tolkien estate. I don't think he can legally well publish anymore it, it's i don't know that would be that would be interesting if he tried again to do that but most people have to buy the rights to do that stuff so i wonder if he would uh anyways he's old and he stepped down from Tolkien estate so my i guess it's an assumption my assumption is he's not gonna write any more of this like he's done mm. and uh, that um, was his last you know work but i think my favorite work of all, well, the Silmarillion is my favorite, but I mean, of all, like the the more novel, structured, like the new, stories. the Christopher Tolkien ones, yeah. yeah. Is, well, Silmarillion uh, is that too, I guess. For me, it's uh, uh, the actual full novel of the Children of Huron. Yeah, it's really good. Is it's so really good. good. Oh, yeah. it's so good. And this story, in and of itself, the tragic it's it's a, it's a it's a huge like tragedy story, yeah. right? Now, I don't want to, because we've been going for a long time already, I'm going to try and sum this one up even faster. Because Hurin mocks Morgoth and will not reveal uh, where Gondolin is. Yeah, Hurin's Morgoth amazing. curses his family. Um, and essentially, the, the lives of his wife and son and daughter um, are completely miserable. But again... The curse, the, the doom that's laid out is not like it's totally out of their control. It's not like they don't have any free will in this. In, in, in this. It's just that Turin is so proud. He's so full of pride that if he would just accept Thingol's pardon at the beginning, all of it would have been avoided. But no, he's got to, you know, he can't. He feels like he was wronged, and so he's going, no, like, I, I'm I'm not going to accept the pardon. Like, yeah. you wronged me. you got to come apologize to me. <laughs> right? Yep, yep. <laughs> and it goes into way more detail about his disposition on that in the in the Children of Hurin. But anyways, uh, when Hurin doesn't come back and the lands of Mithrim are overrun by the Easterlings... Um, Morin, who is uh, Turin's mother, so Hurin and Morin are married. Their son is Turin. She sends him to Doriath. And Thingol's temperament toward uh, men at this point is very different. So he actually takes Turin as a foster son uh, to raise him there in Doriath. Um, mm. And so Turin is growing up, but he's 
There's actually a really good line from the Children of Huron that describes him that has always really resonated with me. I've always really related to this. Uh, I'm going to read it really quick. I actually have it as part of my bio on uh, on Facebook, I think. Oh, nice. Um, so what does it say? Details about you. There it is. So the, the passage reads, In other matters also, it seemed that fortune was unfriendly to him, so that often what he designed went awry, and what he desired he did not gain. Neither did he win friendship easily, for he was not merry and laughed seldom, and a shadow lay on his youth. Nonetheless, he was held in love and esteem by those who knew him well. Um, I've always related heavily to this story, and I think to a large extent Tolkien wrote himself, or part of himself, into the character of Turin. And uh, yeah. essentially that part of it, you know. Um, again, someone with so much potential, someone who has greatness within them, but the things they want to do just somehow always go awry. They just he can't really ever get what he wants. And uh, because of that, he's pretty depressed, just not like the happiest guy. But yet, still, he's held in love and esteem because he has this good heart. He wants to do what's right. He's a good person. But his a mixture of his pride and the trauma he suffered keeps him from making the choice that would lead to happiness and constantly like a, a cyclical like self-fulfilling prophecy of just misfortune and woe and trauma mm. and it is one of the one of the better tragedies i feel like i've ever read because of all the reasons i've described about how fate works in this story um uh greg says why doesn't melkor curse all of his enemies uh it's a good question uh, so the, melkor doesn't have that kind the, of power in the fact, rules. Yeah, well, he used to do stuff like that. He doesn't have the power um, to curse all of his enemies, I guess. Um, one of the things what he does with Hurin is he, he what he needs to like keep track of Turin at all times, basically, so that he like um, Morgoth can basically see what's happening with Turin like all the time because he gives that gift to Hurin and Hurin sees everything that's happening oh in right good point thanks for and and that. so like i don't know i've got to us it's an assumption here but that takes something out of morgoth to constantly have this focus on a on a person who is not visible nakedly you've got to be able to be see through buildings and walls and all this kind of stuff right to be able to see the life of this person and morgoth his power has diminished so much that he just can't do that all the time to everybody yeah, like but at one person. point he used to do that kind of stuff, but he just he just can't. He's not that powerful anymore. Well, not only just showing him the events, but also manipulating them. So her exactly. only saw the yeah. bad stuff. Exactly. And yep. anything good that happened was changed or altered in some way to like make it look worse than it was. So I mean, he that's got to take some good. active like active management there on the part of Morgoth. Uh, Swan Knight is saying Turin is based on Siegfried or Sigurd of Norse mythology with a mixture of the story of Sigmund, his father, which also mm. contains some elements of incest with his sister. Interesting. Interesting. Um, okay. So anyways, um, huh. he has, uh, there's somebody, there's an elf named Seros who's jealous of the favor that, uh, he is shown that Turin is shown and mocks him openly. Um, I think what happens is that Turin casts like a, a, a goblet into his face. <laughs> yes. I remember that he just throws it right in his face. Just, it breaks his breaks his uh, it's the way that it's written in the children of Turin is it breaks his mouth. So, you know, cuts him up, maybe chips a tooth, uh, yeah. breaks his nose, maybe something like that. Anyways, He's messed up from it. So Seros gets way pissed. And he's actually going to try to kill Turin uh, mm -hmm. the next day. And and Turin overpowers him and tries to have a little fun with him. Right? Again, a bit of a prideful thing. Like, yes. I'm not just going to, you know, defeat you and then take you back and have justice. I'm going to torment you a little bit. And so yeah. he makes him run. He he strips him naked and, and puts a sword to his butt and makes him yeah, run. Yeah, he like slaps the him forest. with the, the broad end of the sword. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and and Sarus is running for his life thinking he's going to be killed and ends up falling into a ravine and killing himself and Turin's like fool like I I was just about to give up the chase like I wouldn't have actually killed you and but all that Belag sees or I think it's Moblong actually um all that Moblong sees is that Turin was chasing Cyrus naked with a sword and that he ran off a cliff and so it's like, yeah. um, you're going to have to come back with me now and face the justice of the king. And he's right. like, screw you guys. Like, F this, I'm leaving. And so Turin just like takes off, right? Now it's discovered later because in the Children of Hurin, they go over this. They didn't yeah, in there's, some really. There's a woman that was following him yeah. he didn't know about. A girl that he grew up with yeah. when he was raised in Doriath, who was kind of a, an oddball type of elf girl. She wasn't... Yeah. Um, Anyways, she kind of just watched him and they were friends when they were young, but slowly over time as he grew into a man, they became estranged a bit, but she continued watching him. Right. Kind of had a thing for him. And so she's brought to Thingol and her witness is what essentially vindicates Turin. And so he's like, hey, go find him and bring him back. Let him know that he's pardoned. And so Bella goes after him, but by yeah, this Bella. time, Turin has joined like a, a group of outlaws and they're doing some pretty shady stuff. Um, but essentially, Turin ends up becoming the leader. Yeah, of he basically that group. becomes their leader, <laughs> which is pretty um, cool. And so he's he wants to use them for, rather than stealing from, you know, farmsteads and, and killing people and pillaging. He's like, no, we're going to fight the enemies of Morgoth only. So he leads this band of outlaws to sort of like waylay and. You know, just be a thorn in the side to, you know, Morgoth's armies and people mm -hmm. moving around here and there, orcs and stuff. And Belag finds him, lets him know he's pardoned, but but the pride gets in the way again. He's like, nope, I have to pardon Thingol. <laughs> uh -huh, yes, he needs course. to come apologize to me. Yep. And, and, and his Belag's like, look, just if you change your mind, come find me here. And it's like, if you change your mind, you can find me on that hill over there, Amon Rud. And so they go there, they meet a, a dwarf named Mim who lives there and yeah. uh, they capture him. And the men, I mean, these are not good dudes. These are outlaws, right? They're, they're yeah. criminals. And so they end up shooting and killing Mim's son. But Turin was like, oh, like, let him go. Like, we want to, like, work with these people. Uh, Mim promises for sparing his life that he will allow them to live in his house. But when they arrive and find out that Mim's son is dead... They, he was calling it a house of ransom, which was the ransom for his life, Mim's life. But it turns out to be a house of ransom because now he feels like he owes Mim a debt because of the taking of his son's life. <clears throat> so Mim mm. really respects him uh, and, and likes Turin, but he does not like the other dudes. They live there for a while doing their thing. Beleg comes back. Mim really hates elves because... You know, he feels like, oh, we were here in these lands before the Noldor came back from the West. And they Which came and true. took our lands and changed all the names of everything. And so he has a thing against elves. And he ends up betraying the group, <clears throat> given a false promise that Turin would be spared, but all the other people would be killed and he'd get his house back. <clears throat> of course, they don't hold to that. They take Turin um, and they're they're basically holding him captive and they're taking him back to... Uh, Sauron and Beleg uh, goes after him uh, finds Gwyndor remember we brought up Gwyndor earlier the mm. elf who had gotten pissed that they killed his brother in front of him and then he like led the army too quickly in the in the great battle Gwyndor had escaped and Beleg runs into Gwyndor and he's like totally changed he's like a shell of himself just like this ghostly emaciated figure right just like no longer containing the the light and the valor and the nobility he once had he's been totally beaten um anyways he's like oh come with me to nargothron don't turin's like doomed but beleg's like no i'm gonna save my friend i forgot to mention that beleg has a special sword that was actually crafted by Aeol the dark elf remember Meglin's father so it has like a soul unto itself and it was made from a metal of like a, a basically a meteor. So like a metal that's not of this world. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a really strong metal. It's called Anglicel, uh, black sword. Anyways, it kind of has a spirit of its own. And so uh, it, 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 it lusts for blood a little bit, right? <clears throat> Anyways, <clears throat> Belleg is trying to free um, Turin from his bonds 
but the blade slips and it pricks um, Turin, and he's awoken from sleep, thinks that he's being tormented by the orcs, finds himself free, wrestles, doesn't know what's going on, takes the sword, and slays his friend Belig. Again, just this constant, horrible, traumatic misfortune, totally on accident happening to him. And he goes into yeah. just this state of unbelief, madness comes over him. He just, he can't speak. He has no idea like where he is. Gwyndor has to come to him and be like, let's bury Beleg and then I'll take you back to Nargothron. And it takes a few days before he his tears are unloosed and he can finally feel what's happened and his madness passes. But he's taken into Nargothron, renames himself, takes Anglicel the sword for his own, but eventually um, wins a lot of renown and respect uh, in Nargothrond. And Gwyndor's previous fiancé falls in love with Turin. So mm -hmm. again, like, oh, I saved your life and brought you here, and now you're, like, taking my fiancé from me. Like, more discord and just problems that, I mean... Turin's not even into her, right? Like I know that's the that's the <laughs> irony of the whole thing. Yeah. So, anyways, Gwyndor and Turin's counsels are opposite of each other. Olmo tries to warn them, like do like shut the gates of Nargothrond, do not go out and fight. But Turin is like, nope, we're gonna go out there and fight, and we're gonna win renown, and we're gonna kill the orcs, and we're gonna beat them back. His pride gets in the way. They follow his counsels. Terrible loss in the battle. Nargothrond is taken by Glaurung the dragon, who, and this is one of the better one of the better passages I felt that I read in the whole story this time around. I have to scroll to it here a little bit. Um, so, Glaurung has this power where he looks into your eyes. He can sort of paralyze you and sort of speak to you mind to mind <clears throat> and show you like a version of yourself that uh, is obviously not totally true um let's see yes i love the language here again but glarong spoke again taunting turin and he said evil have been all thy ways son of hurin thankless fosterling outlaw slayer of thy friend thief of love usurper of nargothrond captain foolhardy and deserter of thy kin as thralls, thy mother and thy sister live in Dorlomen, in misery and want. Thou art arrayed as a prince, but they go in rags. And for thee they yearn, but thou carest not for that. Glad may thy father be to learn that he hath such a son, as, as learn he shall. And Turin, being under the spell of Glaurung, hearkened to his words, and he saw himself as in a mirror misshapen by malice, and he loathed that which he saw. Um... Again, all these kernels of truth, right? His his pride had led him to become, essentially, all these things are true. Thankless fosterling, right? Uh, yeah. Slayer of thy friend, of course, is an accident, but yes. But when you put it in this light, when you look at it from this perspective, yeah, it looks pretty bad. And... And this is the version of his of his son that Hurin is seeing too. You can yeah. you can bet on that, right? Yeah, yeah. Of course, his heart was always in the right place. He wanted to do good, and he wanted to free the Noldor. And he, you know, that's the reason he fought. He wanted to do good, but everything led to evil. And so, when you put it in that light, look at all these things that you are. It just completely breaks him, and so he doesn't. Listen to Findulius, Find, Findulas, the, yeah. the, the fiance of Gwyndor as she's being taken away. He flees instead first to go try and find his mother and, and sister who he had never met. His mother was pregnant with his sister when he went to Doriath. Hmm. So he's like, I got to go to them, right? Like I have been negligent of my family. But when he gets there, he realizes they've been in Doriath all this time. The lie the, that that part being left out by Glarong made him race there, and then Fuindles was captured. Finds out she was eventually killed. He did not go to help her because he was too concerned about what he had been lied to about. And he's just constantly like tragic, 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 mm -hmm. tragic. So he's like, "Fine, I'll try one more time to rebuild my life, and I'm gonna go live in the forest of Brethlin, uh, Bre Brethlin, Brethlin. I can't remember the name of." Brethel, Brethel, the forest of Brethel. Brethel. 
and start a new life and I'm not going to fight anymore. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, takes, you know, puts away the sword of Anglicel. But at the same time, his mother hears about the fall of Nargothrond, learns that Turin, you know, had been there out of concern for her son, her pride against all the councils of Melian and everyone else. She goes after him to try and find him. Glaurung finds them, erases Nienor's memory entirely. Nienor is the sister. And uh, she wanders. They're lost and scattered. The group that was sent to like protect them as they traveled. Nienor finds her way into the forest of Brethel and is discovered by Turin. He falls in love with her not knowing that it's his sister. And they are eventually wed. She becomes pregnant. Glaurong is there attacking again. He goes with a party to try and kill Glaurong. Eventually does. Sticks his sword into his belly. And as Glaurong is laying there dying, he gets it in his head again to taunt and get revenge on the dragon who ruined his life. And mm. uh, is doing so, pulls out the, the sword and the blood, the venomous blood, runs onto his hand. Glaron locks eyes with him again. He faints, but it appears as if he's dead. Nienor comes running after him, finds him there, tries to heal him, but then Glaron restores her memory. She realizes she married her brother. And another, again, just the last thing that he says... Uh, that Glaron says to her. It's just so powerful. Huh. Um, I was going to say the last thing she says too. Yeah, that as well. It is powerful too. But uh, Where is it? Oh no, that was... Okay, I'm not there yet. Okay, here it is. Then finding that his hand was burned, she washed it with tears and bound it about with a strip of her raiment and she kissed him and cried on him again to awake. Thereat Glaurung stirred for the last time ere he died, and he spoke with his last breath, saying, Hail, Nienor, daughter of Hurin. We meet again ere the end. I give thee joy that thou hast found thy brother at last. I mean, just the, the, the sinister nature of that, right? Like the mockery. I give thee joy that thou hast found mm. thy brother at last <laughs> under such circumstances, you know? Yeah. And now thou shalt know him, a stabber in the dark, treacherous to foes, faithless to friends, and a curse unto his kin, Turin, son of Hurin. But the worst of all his deeds thou shalt feel in thyself. Just like, oh, man. When she was pregnant, punch. she was pregnant at the time, right? Yes, And I think that, punch. that's what he was referring to. Yes, Ooh. he's talking about the fact that you've had ancestral relations with your brother and you've conceived. Yeah. Just like, oh, man, like the, the wording of that is so powerful. And so she loses it, right? Um, yeah. And, she, and so it says here, looking down upon her, and she cried, farewell, oh, twice beloved. I love that line. Yeah, me too. Farewell, oh, twice beloved, my brother and then my husband, right? So twice beloved. Yeah. Um, doom of, uh, Master of Doom by Doom Mastered, oh, happy to be dead. Uh, basically, she ran and cast herself into the water, killing herself and the unborn child. Mm. Turin wakes up. Um, there was a a man named Brandir who had been jealous of their love, had been in love with her, a bit of a rival for, for Turin in the community. He mm. goes back and tells the people what happened and uh, claims that um, Turin is dead. And then Turin comes up and is like, hey, where's Nienor? Like, what's going on? Like, the dragon's dead. Be of good cheer. And then Brandir tells him, no, she's dead because you are her brother and your doom, like, essentially, like, ruined her life and our life and everyone's life. And, like, you, I hate you. And, and he gets so angry at him for saying that stuff because he hears, it says something like he hears the footsteps of his doom catching up with him or something along that line. So he, mm-hmm. he knows there's a kernel of truth in that, but he doesn't want to believe it. He slays Brandir. Uh, runs away in madness. Then Moblong ends up finding him, confirming that it was all true. And then Turin just loses it, realizes he just killed Brandir unjustly um, and goes and falls on the sword of Anglicel. And he actually speaks to it before so. 
Um, and I liked this line too. So the sword actually speaks to him. He says, Hail Gurthang, because he, he named the sword Gurthang. No lord or loyalty dost thou know, save the hand that wieldeth thee. From no blood wilt thou shrink. Will, there, will thou therefore take Turin Turambar? Wilt thou slay me swiftly? And from the blade rang a cold voice in answer, Yea, I will drink thy blood gladly, so that I may forget the blood of Beleg, my master, and the blood of Brandir slain unjustly. I will slay thee swiftly. Wow. He falls on the hilt. <sighs> and then all of this was seen by Hurin. By, yep. uh, Hurin. And uh, Morgoth claims to have pity you know, on him. He's like, let it not be said of us that we have, that we'd have no uh, pity for our foes or whatever. And he lets him go again, but he's being watched because he figures after having seen all that tragedy, he's going to try and go back to Gondol and he's going to try and find Doriath. He's going to lead him to these places. Hmm. So all of this, oh my gosh, like all of this horrible stuff that Morgoth puts in place, you know, all for the sake of trying to find Gondolin. It's just, it's awful. It's Anyways, terrible. Um, um, Swan Knight fourteen asks: Is the Children of Huron novel worth reading? Is it better than the Silmarillion version? Yes, um, I would say yes. It's absolutely worth reading. Yes, it is. Yeah, Bye. I th I think you should read it for sure. Um, okay, so what ends up happening is he tries to find uh. Hurin finds his wife and she dies right there too from grief and so he's just like totally alone in the world wandering around tries to find his way back to Gondolin but he's being spied on remember so he calls out to the air like uh like Turgon like fetch you like where are you now like kind of a yep. thing um and so Morgoth learns the region in which Gondolin lays at that point he's like okay I know more or less where it is Cool, good, keep going. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so he wanders all the way down to Nargothrond where Glarung had sort of like been hoarding the treasure and stuff. Um, and Mim is there trying to take the treasures. And so Hurin slays Mim in retribution for betraying his son, takes um, a treasure called the Naglamir, which is a, a dwarven necklace created by the old dwarves, like the ancient dwarves, as a gift to Finrod. And he takes that to Nar to Doriath and casts it at the feet of Thingol and says something like, um, oh, what does he say? It's super cool. Um, Receive thou thy fee, he cried, for thy fair keeping of my children and my wife. For this is the Naglamir, whose name is known to many among elves and men, and I bring it to thee out of the darkness of Nargothron, where Finrod thy kinsman left it behind him, when he set forth with Baron, son of Barahir, to fulfill the errand of Thingol of Doriath. Right, so he's very aggressive mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, accusation there. Anyways, they explain to him, Melian explains what really happened, all the good that he didn't see along the way, all the parts that Morgoth hid from him. He sort of repents of his pride there. Um, his wrath and his pride he gave no heed to his peril, but spoke to them in scorn, saying, How do ye uncouth race? Oh, no, sorry, I went too far. Anyways, he brings the Naglamir, and so now Thingol gets it in his mind that he's going to um, combine the Silmaril with the Naglamir, the two treasures, the greatest treasure of the dwarves with the greatest treasure of the elves. Combine them, and he's going to wear the Silmaril as a necklace. Yep. <sighs> this does not go well. The dwarves this, is part of, <laughs> this is part of why the dwarves hate the elves. <laughs> yes. A lot of it comes down to this. So he gets the dwarves, the dwarven craftsmen, to come and try and achieve this. The dwarves look on the Silmaril and the Naglamir, like essentially a relic of their people, and they're like, uh, we want that. But they're like, okay, we'll make it. So he sits with them as they're creating this. They put the two pieces together, and of course, the whole plan along is, well... This was a gift to Finrod, the Naglamir, after they've put the Silmaril in it, right? So this isn't even yours. This doesn't belong to you. This belongs to our people. We should take the Naglamir, again, after having put the Silmaril in it, right? <laughs> right. So they want to take the Silmaril, really. Yeah, yeah, that's but, the real thing. So anyways, he's surrounded by all these dwarves, um, and Thingol's pride takes over again. He says, and pride he gave no in his pride he gave no heed to his peril, 
but spoke to them in scorn, saying, How do ye of uncouth race dare to demand aught of me, Eru Thingol, or Elu Thingol, lord of Beleriand, whose life began by the waters of Kuvinian, years uncounted ere the fathers of the stunted people awoke? And standing tall and proud among them, he bade them with shameful words be gone unrequited from Doriath. So they kill him. <laughs> and like, just dude, like, so the pride of these people. First of all, had he just surrendered the Silmaril to the sons of Fanor, there wouldn't have been a problem. Had he yeah. not decided, I want to have the treasure of the dwarves and of the elves combined, and I'll be the lord of the Silmaril, right? And then when they're basically surrounding him, all these dwarves, he's like, no, F you guys. You're like, I'm like way above you. And so they take his life. And Doriath completely falls into like chaos after that because they've never had a king other than Thingol there. Melian has totally like lost it with sorrow. And she eventually uh, leaves and goes back to Valinor and just sort of leaves the kingdom as is. Um, it gives the Silmaril back to Baron and Luthien. Um, and they have a son named Dior who is essentially the the heir of Doriath now. So Dior takes the Silmaril and uh, actually first they waylay, the, they, they slay all those dwarves who were trying to escape with the Noglimir. So that's, you know, they take the Silmaril back from them. But um, in any case, Dior becomes the king in Doriath. And then, well, I think I got something a little mixed up there. The, the Silmaril was in Luthien's hands for a long time. Dior went and took up the kingship in Doriath. But they, they left the Silmaril with Luthien. So the Noglamir necklace with the Silmaril was left with Luthien. And the sons of Fanor never dared to try and take it back from her. Or, or Baron, who had like wrested it from Morgoth's crown. And, you know, the whole fate... <laughs> that had, had taken place within those two. They didn't dare. But as soon as they died, when Baron and Luthien actually die, the, the Silmaril is sent to Dior and Doriath, and that's when the sons of Maedhro, or the sons of Fanor decide to attack. And so mm -hmm. they attack Doriath, they sack it. Um, the, the two sons of Dior are left to starve in the wilderness as young boys. Um, Maethros gets really pissed when he hears about that. He's like, he, he goes and tries to find them. He, he, he's really, really mad at the way his brothers handled it. But to, I think three of the sons of Fanor die. Kelegorm, Kurafin, and Karanthir all die in that battle. Um, mm. And so Maethros tries to make up for it, can't do it. But the daughter of, Baron, or of Dior, um, Elwing, escapes to the... Um, the the four what do they call it? it where Kirden is at the the havens yeah so elwing escapes to the havens now remember this is the line of uh thingol and melian yeah, right so baron and luthien yeah yeah the numenor so thingol and melian which goes down to baron and luthien which goes down to dior which goes down to elwing okay so from that house is elwing and that's going to come in a little bit later Anyways, that's the fall of Doriath. It's destroyed now, so two of the three hidden kingdoms have been destroyed. Doriath and Nargothrond, and now Gondolin is the only one left standing. And that is the story that we left off on. The fall of Gondolin, which is the first chapter for next week. Which is also a really good story. <laughs> yes, it is. Anyways, um, we got on for a super long time. Sweet. We'll just finish but... next week, so... Yeah, next week we finish the book. Um, anything that anyone wants to add? Anything that they, that they said we didn't read that was good insight that you saw or a good question? Uh, there, Yeah, there was a couple. Um, well, a few people were asking questions about uh, Baron and Luthien and how the whole thing worked. Let me... Oh, yeah, somebody said, how long were they in the afterlife for? We, I don't know that we really know that. Um, but Swan Knight gave some pretty cool... Just a really cool quote because... Um, J.R.R. Tolkien based the story of Baron and Luthien on, on he and his wife, not necessarily the whole like dramatic story, yeah. but um, the, like he, apparently the way Tolkien um, fell in love with his wife is he saw her dancing alone in the glade somewhere. Yes. And yes. So with flowers. And that's how, of course, Baron sees Luthien for the first time. And right. So, 
anyways, on the on their tombstones, uh, it says J.R. Tolkien um, Baron, and then mm-hmm. his wife's name. I, I can't remember her name. And then Luthien underneath that. So anyway, yeah. and all, especially the way the story goes with the way they, they kind of die, they come back and they're reunited, but they, they eventually pass on from the world, right? And th- it's funny because I don't know exactly when um, a lot of these stories were written, but Tolkien's wife didn't die until quite, uh, until pretty, not too long before he himself died. And my guess would be that the final touches of the Baron and Luthien story were, were put into place after his wife had passed away. Mm. I think the story wouldn't be the same without that experience that, that he had lived. Without the, the loss exact death. Right. Yeah. So there was that comment, which is really cool. Dude, McGuire talked about that as well. And, um, Oh, people talk about the deus ex machina. Apparently, Deus Ex Machina, and I've heard this before, but th- talking about um, how uh, Deus Ex Machina initially was in Greek plays and it meant a god would show up suddenly to influence the story in a Greek play. Yeah. So it did actually involve gods. The way we use the term now isn't the way the Greeks used it, but the way Tolkien sure. uses it is the way the original Greek plays were apparently used. So that was a very good comment as well from uh, V. Shalak, it seems. Oh, nice. Yep. And um, I'm pretty sure that's yeah. Yeah. Oh, this whole okay. And then this whole why okay, somebody asked a really interesting question. This is from Vasali. If Lewin if Lewin is a couldn't Thingle have just accepted their romance as a tiny part of her life and just let it go? Mm. Now very interesting question, but the answer is no. <laughs> because first off, they were gonna have they would have children, right? Those children were going to be Thingol's grandchildren. They were mm-hmm. going to be, I don't know, especially, you know, from a very conservative, very old perspective, um, mixed race children were just were not very well looked upon by most people, even humans who are just like whatever. Uh, you think of the elves having never ever had a mixed race child other than with like a Maiar or something like Luthien herself, you know, not marrying down. It, it would be, it would just be an absolute disgrace for them to do that in their perspective. Right. And of course things slowly seem to kind of change on that, especially after Baron and Luthien, because there are other elf man marriages that happen. And as well, you see the respect that Elrond has in the Lord of the Rings. He is Elrond, the half elven, but everybody they they really look up to him, and he's one of the great oracles of Middle Earth. And um, clearly, the idea of oh, an um, elf and a man mixed together is just awful. Kind of weeds its itself out of their culture a little bit. Um, but at this point, it was very much a part of their culture. And I mean, you could think of certain instances, even among humans, where they wouldn't have wanted something like that, uh, not in the not too distant past. Mm. yeah just the pride the pride of being the elder race of having seen the light of the trees of aman being of the eldar uh mother being a maya being of the ainur like yeah to to thingol's mind at least at that time uh baron shouldn't even have the grace of being in the presence shouldn't even be in doriath at all Exactly. much less dating his daughter but it is an interesting thought to think of it as in the in their perspective just being like a summer fling right it's like it would be over and done with but then you'd yeah. have kids <laughs> there would be grandkids that would have a legitimate uh claim to the to be heirs of doria ship exactly this was a king we're talking about yeah so it really would seriously complicate things in his realm so yeah, Elrond is. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll get into that next week. Elrond's lineage is going to be. Yeah, we'll learn about Elrond um, next week. El coming from Elwing on one side, right? So we've learned about Elwing being Dior's daughter, who is now safe or is taking refuge at the havens of. Uh, where the where the ships leave to Valinor, right? Oh, one thing I did forget to mention: they've been trying now for a while to get to send ships to Valinor. Uh, Turgon has sent emissaries to try and find it. Um, Cairdon, the shipwright, has been building ships and sending them into the west. 
they have been trying to get the Valar's attention, to ask them for pardon, to ask for their help. And every single one of those ships has been lost and never returned. I think mm-hmm. there was only one elf who was sent by Turgon, they mentioned, that actually survived and made it back. But the ship was wrecked and everyone else was lost. So the elves have been trying now <laughs> to, to, to sue for pardon from the Valar and, ask for, and request them to come and help. And the Valar are not having it. It's like, nope, you guys, you guys chose this. We told you not to go. You freaking slew your kin. You disregarded us. You mocked the Valar. You, we're not helping you. So that's the situation they're in. The Valar are not coming to help, and they're almost completely ruined now. All their kingdoms have been destroyed except Gondolin. They've, they, you, either you're in Gondolin right now, or you're at the Havens, where Círdan is at. Those are like the two refuges left. Or you are a thrall of Morgoth at this point. That is it. Every other kingdom, every other land, every other hold that they had. I guess you could say in Osirian, maybe the green elves in the woods, you know, they've got their thing. But in terms of the Noldor, you are at Círdan's Havens, or you're in Gondolin. Otherwise... You belong to Morgoth now. So it's not a good situation. And now we're going to learn about how Gondolin falls, and then it's really going to be over for them. Okay, that's it for this week. Make sure and finish the book by next week. There's only two chapters left in the Quintus Silmarillion. And then you'll have the Akalabeth, which tells of the Numenorians, which is the lineage of Aragorn. And then we'll have the Rings of Power in the Third Age. So just a little bit more background as a footnote onto what happens in the Third Age. And that'll be it. Sweet. Thanks for watching, everybody. Swan Knight, real quick, says, uh, The Glorfindel who died fighting against a Balrog in the Fall of Gondolin is the same Glorfindel who helped the Hobbits in the Fellowship of the Ring. Tolkien yes. confirmed that. Um, this is true. There is also another elf they've mentioned, Gilgalad who is the heir of Fing, Fingolfin. So Fingolfin's son is Fingon. Fingon's son is Gilgalad. Gilgalad is at the Havens, and he is the elf lord at the time of the prologue of Fellowship of the Ring. So that big yeah. battle that happens at the beginning of Fellowship yeah, of the, the Ring. Yeah, the last alliance, yeah. That's Gilgalad and his elf alliance with, um, with uh, what's the guy's name? Who cuts the ring from Sauron's hand? Um, Isildur's father. Isildur. Yeah, Isildur and his father led the men of Numenor. What was Isildur's dad's name? Isildur, son of the king. <laughs> son of the king. But his dad was famous. <laughs> yeah, I forget his name. El- Elendil? Anyways, Elendil? Elendil. Elendil. Yeah, Elendil name. and Isildur. That's it. Okay. So, Elendil, who is actually a descendant of Elrond's brother, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, Elendil and Isildur led the men of Numenor. And uh, Gilgalad led the elves in that battle. So Gilgalad is the grandson of Fingolfin, essentially. So he's at the Havens now, too. Okay. That's it for Realista. All right, dude. We'll see you guys next week. Peace, Peace out. Peace out. Peace. <laughs> nice. <laughs>